SME Market Hub. Buy, sell, list, connect. Kanu, an ancient city known for its culture and tradition. Situated in northern Nigeria. We're here to visit a man with royal roots, a banker by trade, who rose up the ranks to become governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. A keen academic with a passion for debating and a commitment to the truth. He is no stranger to controversy and international headlines. A family man who is dedicated to public service and has become an icon in the eyes of many. We're here to speak to the Emir of Kanu, Mohammed Sanusi II. Your Highness, thank you very much. I read somewhere that it has been your lifelong wish to become the Mayor of Kanu. Is that true first? And how does it feel for that wish to come true? You know, we say that usually it's not called for children of lawyers to want to be lawyers and children of doctors to want to be doctors. But we all know that out of the hundred or thousand princes that you have, only one will be aiming at one point in time. Yeah. And we leave it to God to decide. Um, but yes, it's something that I've always wanted. I've grown up, uh, I grew up in this palace. I've never really wanted to be anything other than what my family was. But it's not something you work for. You have your education, you have your career, you have uh, opportunities that you take. And you're not going to spend your time uh, obsessed by something that you know is going to happen to only one person and it may not be you. So mm. if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it's God's will. Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, who holds degrees in economics and Islamic studies, was crowned as the 14th Emir of Kano in 2014. The appointment makes him one of the most influential Muslim leaders in Nigeria. Can you talk about how um, the Emir's role is important to Kano itself and important to the North and to Nigeria? The Emir is uh, no longer the political authority constitutionally. Uh, there are elected governors. We continue to be in charge of the mosques, continue to be justices of the peace every day. If you come Monday to Thursday, there are people who come with issues. Some of them farm disputes. There are marital issues between husbands and wives, issues between neighbors, uh, daughters who complain about being forced into marriage. And our role really is to address those concerns. 70% um, of the issues that happen between people in civil cases in this part of the country don't go to court. The court system is too expensive. They do recognize this system, they respect it, and they feel they'll get justice. And usually when we adjudicate, they abide by the adjudication. Kanu has been subject to terrorist attacks in recent times, the deadliest of which occurred in November 2014, when suicide bombers and gunmen attacked the Kanu Central Mosque during Friday prayers. How does it feel that it's so close to home and it's happening to your people? Well, you know, we're going through difficult times and we are going through a very difficult period in our nation's history. And it's a combination of things. There is the, obviously, the fact that you have a murderous group that kills people, uh, that claims to be Muslim and obviously has killed more Muslims than any other uh, group you can think of. We're dealing not just with a security problem, which hopefully can be addressed militarily in the short term. Yeah. You're dealing with an entire way of life that's disappeared. I mean, think of a town like Chibok. You know, if those girls came back, how are they going to, you know, and we've got to deal with those issues. You've got to deal with an economy. Mm. You've got to revive um, agriculture. You've got to have industrialization. And 
uh, and frankly, some of the serious governance issues we've had, some of the uh, very bad economic choices that we made in the past, policy choices we made in the past, have contributed to the problems that we have. Having said that, to your question, we, we have to live with it. We have to tell people that they need to have courage. The, the, the worst thing you can do to yourselves is be scared by terrorists and run away and change your life. You've got to understand that this is not religion and they do not need support and they should not be feared. We have to remain true to our values and our principles and hopefully uh, with the right political will on the part of authorities will defeat them. Do you have more confidence within the new administration coming in to deal with such issues? Well, first of all, if you've tried something for 16 years and it doesn't seem to be working, it's worthwhile to try something else. Mm. And I think there is the whole issue of expectations that need to be managed. Yes. The problems are very severe. When I was governor, one of the issues I raised was that 80% of federal government revenue was spent on personal costs. So you've got a country of 167 million people spending 80% of its revenue maintaining 1 million public offices and the remaining 20% for the remaining 166 million people. And that is the money that's going to be used to build schools, to build hospitals, to build roads, to give us power. It's not going to work. So it sounds like you, you were quite in favour of change. I personally, um, I'm not supposed to be in any kind of partisan politics, but I'm a Nigerian, where I think that the country, uh, it's, it's good for the country for a number of reasons. First of all, it, look, the very fact that we now know that an incumbent president does not have an automatic second ticket mm. is going to improve mm. the behavior of presidents. Absolutely. I mean, people are going to know that the electorate, the, the, this is the first time votes are really counting. And if we can continue with that, then People are going to know that if you want to win an election, you've got to serve the people. And, and that, that's how the rest of the world has moved on. But let's talk about the personalities for a short while. So in terms of um, your relationship with Jonathan now, um, how is your relationship like? Have you spoken to him since he lost the elections? No, I haven't. Um, I've always had a very formal relationship with him. I met him in Abuja when I was appointed Governor of Central Bank, he was Vice President. Mm. Uh, I worked with him uh, in an official capacity. It's not as if we were personal friends or anything. I mean, if you have a job, you do your job. As Governor of Central Bank, my job was stability. Um, and it, I know there are people who think their job is to make their boss happy. Mm. Uh, and I always say that if, you, if the boss wants to be happy, he goes to his wife. He doesn't go to Central Bank Governor. My job was to keep inflation down, have a stable exchange rate, make sure the banks were safe, mm. uh, work on the payment system, get financial inclusion, and that's my job. Now, in doing that job, people might be happy or they may not be happy. So long as the, the job, job was done, mm. that was my role as Governor of Central Bank. Mm. If I cannot do the job the way my conscience is I should do it, it's not worth having. I can always do something else. Um, and hey, look at me now. Uh, this is for me better than being governor of central bank. So uh, I was kicked up. So no, I, I haven't spoken to him. I, I have. There's obviously no problem at all. And if I if I do see him, I will speak to him. Okay. Okay. The reason I ask is, is because, of course, um, we all know about the situation that happened in terms of when you were governor and the alleged missing $20 billion, which led to your suspension then. No, but, but that was my choice. I mean, if you, if you don't want to get into trouble, you don't ask uncomfortable questions. Okay. I mean, if you, if you, if you did the kind of thing I did, mm. you had to be prepared for certain consequences. Mm. So I, I do think I, probably if I were, if I were President Jonathan, I would have fired me as well. <laughs> so I, I, I do think it's, um, I mean, other people would see it and keep quiet. And, mm. and, and if, if you chose not to keep quiet, then you must be ready to accept the consequences. And, and the good thing is, okay, now you've had a PwC report. Yeah. 
And the PwC report says, well, it was not 20 billion, it was 18.5 billion. As far as I'm concerned, even based on the PwC report, there is at least $12.5 billion that's been diverted from the country. And I, it was very clear to me as governor of Central Bank that money belonging to the Federation is not coming. Yeah. It was very clear to me that if we did not bring in that money when oil price was high, mm. if oil price crashed, we were going to have major problems with the exchange rates, uh, with interest rates, with inflation, probably with the banking system and economic growth and all of that has happened. And yeah. since my job was stability, if I felt those leakages were a potential source of instability, I had a responsibility to shout. Mm. And so I did my job. Um, I'm only responsible for my actions. Uh, the president did what he felt he had to do. Mm -hmm. And history will judge who's right. Like you said, you were just doing your job. Um, but you must have known when you made that announcement, certain repercussions would come of it. Were well, you... I, was, I was warned before I got to the Senate that there would be consequences. Okay. But you weren't scared, you weren't deterred, you didn't think... It's totally immaterial. Uh, whether you're scared or not, I mean, you're a human being and yes, you know, you have a family, it could have been worse. Mm. I could have been shot, I could have lost my life, you never, you never can tell. And um, you could have been locked up if when, when I was suspended in Niger, if I had Landed in Abuja, I probably have, would have been arrested and held by SSS. There could have been trumped up charges. And you can think of any kind of scenario that would have been much, much worse mm. than that than happened. At the height of his banking career in 2009, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi was appointed governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria by the late former president, Yal Adua. Okay, so going back to, I guess, your former life when you were a banker, um, why was banking the industry that you chose? I didn't, actually, I think um, I've always asked myself that. <laughs> um, I never, uh, throughout my university days, I actually had very little respect for banking as a profession. I, I never thought it was something I wanted to do. Um, I started off as an academic and my ambition was to be a professor of economics. Okay. So I started teaching and <laughs> General Buhari again, uh, General Buhari had a coup and he again he came into power at a time when the economy was more or less similar to what he's inheriting now, to the Second Republic. And he had to introduce austerity measures which we're talking about mm. and one of the measures introduced was there would be no more fellowships and scholarships for lecturers for postgraduate studies in areas that were available in Nigerian university. Now the attraction of being in academics for many young people then was a chance to go abroad. The university would pay, give you a fellowship and you go and do your PhD in a good university in Europe or America and then come back and teach. And I was not willing to spend four years doing a PhD in a Nigerian university. So um, I got, I was so angry uh, <laughs> that I couldn't go. So I got, to, I, got, I, got I applied for a job uh, in Icon at that time. And, the, and merchant banking then looked a bit exciting, more exciting than commercial banking. So I got a job in Icon Merchant Bank. Uh, and that was how I started off. The MA was born in Kanu on the 31st of July 1961 to Mohammed Lamido Sanusi and Hajia Saude. He is the second of seven children. I just want to touch a little bit more on your childhood when you were younger. What kind of child were you? Were you did you have lots of friends? Were you Mr. Popular? Were you the guy that everyone wanted to know? How are you? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, I had a very happy childhood. Extremely playful. I. I, I, I was a lot of trouble for, for, for many people, I think. I went to boarding school at a very early age. Uh, I, I went to a Catholic school in Kaduna, St. Anne's. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time in boarding school and then my holidays at home. And, and it's all, it makes for a happy childhood when you've, you've got this change um, in environment. And then from there I went to King's College and the same thing, every holiday I'd be here. Yeah. and then I'd, I'd go off. Yeah. The thing with this palace is you, you, it's a very large family. You all grew up with cousins, distant cousins, uncles. I got along well with 
uh, so many of my friends and cousins, and they've remained um, uh, uh, very close. And, and I was, very, and I've, I've been very close. Uh, I've been, a, as far as the family is concerned, I've always been close to relatives, and I've always believed it was important to the family was always important. So growing up, who were your heroes? Like, who did you look up to? My biggest hero was my grandfather. Okay. Uh, he. And, the, and that's the truth. Um, he's, he's been, he, he's, I mean, if there's one person that's been a constant um, in my life, it's been him. Mm. Now, my father had one of the greatest influences on me. I, I remember one thing my father said to me when I was 16 or 17. He said, you know, you can, there are about a hundred things a young man wants to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, but all you need is to look at two or three things and you'll be amazed at how by holding on to one or two simple rules, you define yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think later in life, I found one thing to define myself, which is speak truth to power. And so if you look at my entire life, all the problems I've had, Mm. I've had to do with that. Mm. Whether it was National Assembly's 25% or Jonathan's 20 billion or debates I had within the banking system or my shared base when you look at my articles, it was always just telling myself that, look, you know what? No matter what the cost is, mm. if this is the truth, I'm going to say it. And, and that's, that's now what I'm known for. And that's how I hope to be remembered after my death. You know, nothing else, just somebody who speaks the truth. The Emir has three wives and 12 children, five of which are boys and seven are girls. How are you as a father to your children? Are you like the cool dad that they can talk to about anything or are you quite a strict father? I'm, no, no, I'm not, I'm not strict. Um, but I, I must say that I haven't uh, been able to give as much time. Mm. Uh, as I would like to uh, to them, um, and you know this is one of the challenges of public service, public office. You you have to give up some of that, and sometimes even if you don't have the time to sit down and talk to them, just letting them be around you and watch you and see you and listen to you as to people helps them. I mean, sometimes I'm faced with a situation and I'm saying, how would my father handle this situation? Okay, and I'm able to actually make that judgment because he spent a lot of time talking to me about his own experiences. Um, I suppose everybody, not just an emir, everybody at, your, at one stage in their life turns around and says, you know, I wish I'd spent more time with the kids, yeah, you know. But, you know. Of okay. For the record, I have three wives, not four. <laughs> okay. But I will have a fourth one. You will have a fourth one? Yeah. Is that anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, women are so good. You should have as many as you're allowed to have. <laughs> Let's touch on what you like to do in your spare time. Do you have any hobbies? Is there anything you do when you're not here being the Emir? Oh, I, I used, uh, I do love Arsenal football team, and I, I watch football. I that, and and yes. uh, okay. I, I, tr I would when I have time. Mm. I, I, I try to, I try to watch them sometimes um, okay. at the risk of, at the risk of having a heart attack. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I, have I you ever know. been to watch them, to watch them live? Have you ever gone? Oh to yes, watch them? actually, I, a few weeks ago, months ago, uh, I, I was I actually was in Monaco when they beat Monaco 2 -0. Okay. I went to watch. Yeah. Uh, I went to watch the match. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I go to London and they have a game. Mm. Um, I haven't been to the Emirates as an Emir, but it was something I used to do quite regularly. Every time okay. I was in London, I say, "Is there a match?" I'll, I'll confess. Sometimes <laughs> I would arrange my official meetings in London to be in a week when Arsenal had a match in London. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you about your personal style. So when you're not dressed as an Emir, are you very much into style and fashion. I mean, if you, if you noticed throughout my in Central Bank, I basically wore one of two things. It was either my Nehru jacket or my bow tie. I mean, I had mm. actually was mm. a bow tie person throughout my banking career. Throughout, from 
the 80s, I was known, we had a small group myself, Konya Jai, Felicia Phillips, there was a small group of people that were known uh, for wearing bow ties. And then too many people started wearing bow ties. So I started to wear my uh, inner jackets. But here, obviously, you, this institution is one that basically you just have wardrobes and wardrobes and wardrobes and wardrobes, you know, and different yeah. things, yeah. If you were in the room with a group of young people, what advice would you give them in terms of how to have a happy and successful life coming from someone who has achieved that? Well, first, I, I think people should always be themselves, okay? Uh, I tell my children, do what makes you happy and what you're good at. Okay. Okay, so... I'm not the kind of father that would, sit, that would tell my child, I want you to be a lawyer, I want you to be a doctor. I have a daughter who just got admission in the American University of Paris, American University of Paris, and she wants to read media studies. Mm. Not what you think of a kind of princess, but they must always remember how fortunate they are. Now for every one child like that, that's able to go to the American University in Paris, there are millions of her age mates in this country who can't even get into a Nigerian university. Yeah, of course. Okay, so when she comes back, what can she do to make it easier for some of those millions? Mm -hmm. Even if it's just writing in the newspapers and drawing the attention of the world to it, you know, that's something. But uh, you must always know that you have a responsibility, that mm -hmm. privilege comes with responsibility. And I think once and I think more and more young people understand that. What is the African dream to you? I think it's, in a sense, so sad that our continent, so much potential, mm. um, hasn't made it yet. Mm. Having said that, I think Africans need to know that there are many African stories. You have small African countries making a lot of progress. What we need is have the big ones get their act together. How do we get the right leadership in those countries? With a vision and with a sense of responsibility. And, and that's the kind of generation that we need to cultivate. Mm. If we want an African dream, we've got to get, we've got to produce Africans. I mean, Africans who are citizens of the world, citizens of the continent, mm -hmm. and, and that, 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 that's a big ask, but that's, but you said a dream, yes. and, and that's a dream. Thank you very much, Your Highness, for giving us time to tell us about your life and your African dream. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you enjoyed this video, mm -hmm, subscribe to Indani TV channel and you can watch more videos here.